Great to see everyone today. Welcome to Redeemer Church. And uh, wow, what a week we've had. Huh? Who's excited about the 90 degree temps that we continue to have, right? It's been, uh, yeah, don't put away all those summer clothes just quite yet. Who's, who wants fall? Like, I'm ready for some cooler temps, right? You're, you're kind of like, it doesn't matter. It's 95 degrees. I'm still going to be drinking my pumpkin spice latte, regardless of the temperature, right? But But if you've been with us for a while, just as Travis said, we have been going through the book of Romans, and specifically we kicked off Romans chapter 8 last week, the great 8, and we only covered one verse. And so if you're expecting to cover through Romans 8 one verse at a time, sorry to disappoint, we have a whopping three verses today. So seriously, John, that's all you have for us. I I tried, I tried, that's all I could get through, three verses, so... Uh, But quite honestly, I'm not sure how long we're going to be here in Romans chapter 8. So we'll just see how the Lord leads and specifically as we talk about today, see how the Spirit leads. So uh, anything we could do to just kind of push off Romans chapter 9, right? Uh, Oh, we're going to have some fun with Romans chapter 9. So just you wait, Uh, but not before the Lord has so, so much for us in Romans chapter 8. So uh, I had a few people that came up to me last week, and which is great. And I always love uh, feedback um, from my message. And, uh, and so they said, hey, you know, you focused a lot as far as the first part of Romans 8.1. Uh, there, therefore, is now no condemnation. But you didn't really spend a whole lot of time talking about the second half of Romans 1, which is for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I would say that you aren't wrong and that it is indeed of utmost importance to recognize and embrace truly what it means to be in Christ Jesus because they are synonymous with one another as far as verse 1 is concerned. There is therefore now no condemnation as long as you are in Christ Jesus. And if you are in Christ Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation. So every believer should know what must be done in order to be in Christ Jesus. Not only for our own gospel assurance, but also for the sake of sharing the gospel with others. What one must do to be in Christ Jesus is repenting of your sin. Confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Embracing and accepting the free gift that is offered to those who believe. Holding fast to Christ's righteousness and choosing to follow after him. These are the things that one must do in order to be in Christ Jesus. But what does it mean? What does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? And this is a very multifaceted answer. I don't think there is a mere one word that sums up All that it means to be in Christ Jesus as far as the realities, the benefits, and the privileges that we now have to be in Christ Jesus. One commentator states that we may not fully understand what it means to be in Christ Jesus until we see our Savior face to face. And I wouldn't disagree with this. But one definitive area that we could look to, that we have looked to as far as what it means to be in Christ Jesus, if we could reach back and look to Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. And these are the verses that we actually cite as far as our baptism verses are concerned here at Redeemer Church. And what it means is this. It is not only outwardly identifying as a Christian, as a follower of Christ. It also means that we look at this divine permanent union that we now have with Jesus Christ. If we recall, his death is now our death. His burial is now our burial. His resurrection is now our resurrection. Romans 6, 3, and 4. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him in by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And this is very important. If we have been baptized with Jesus into his death, if we have been buried with Jesus into his death, that means that we, we have died. And who have we died to? We have died to self. The old man, the old woman has died 
and has been buried. And the new man, the new woman, has been raised, has been resurrected into newness of life. And this is a question that we must regularly ask ourselves. Do we live our life as one that has died to self? Do we regularly make a practice of dying to self? Can we honestly say, according to Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Do we identify with that? Who is in the driver's seat of our life. Who's running the show? Who is seated on the throne of our life? In fact, what is seated on the throne of our life? These are questions we must answer when considering what it means to be found in Christ. And it's a pretty important question because as we saw from last week, If we are not in Christ, there is condemnation upon us. And in Latin, damnation that still rests upon us. So as glorious and as triumphant as the words of no condemnation ring out with gospel light, truly proclaim one of the greatest realities that we have, if not the greatest reality that we have in Christ, it is still something that we must approach with grave consideration when we see these words for those who are in Christ Jesus. May we not just gloss over these words, but may we truly answer that question. Have we died to self? And make sure that We approach this with grave consideration, working out our salvation with fear and trembling according to Philippians 2, 12. And this aspect of being in Christ introduces us to our passage today with the stark reality of this, that we are not able to do all the things that the Lord has called us to do as far as being in Christ in our own power, in our own strength. We need help. And as we see Throughout the book of Romans, we need the help of the Holy Spirit. It is the helper. It is the Holy Spirit. It is the third person of the Trinity through whom the Father sent in Christ's name, who teaches us all things and brings to remembrance all all that Christ has taught according to John 14, 26. It is the Holy Spirit that is placed into the life of every believer upon conversion that will give us the power to endure to the end. And this is why the Holy Spirit is the predominant theme as we see in Romans chapter 8, as it is mentioned how many times? 20 times. 20 times in chapter 8 alone. So this is why we see that the importance of walking not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. This is why we see the importance of putting to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. This is why we see and know that we are children of God because the Spirit testifies to this. This is why the Spirit intercedes for us according to the will of God in verse 27 and also helps us in our weakness according to verse 26. And this is where Paul is directing us towards in these verses Yes, three verses, two, three, and four, where we see the glorious display of the Trinity all at work as far as our great salvation is concerned. So let's jump in. Chapter 8, verses 2 through 4. We'll go ahead and read verse 1 as well. This, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to bless our time together. Lord, Help us to see and know and understand as we traverse through 
the great eight, the mighty chapter of Romans 8, what it means to walk according to the Spirit. May we be followers of Christ and a church that submits to the Spirit, that walks with the Spirit, that does not grieve the Spirit. Lord, we know in your word that the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. And so, Lord, allow us to step into these things that you have for us in your word and allow your word to illuminate our lives through the Spirit, Lord, that we may be able to be found faithful in all that you have called us to do in this short time that we have here on this earth, Lord. We ask these things in your name. Amen. So what we see from our selected verses today is we see somewhat of a sandwich. And so we see in verses 1 and 2 this aspect of justification. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then we see how the law of the Spirit has set us free from the law of sin and death. And so both of those verses speak into justification. And this is our positional standing as far as righteousness is concerned. And then verse 3, we see this topic of the incarnation. And then verse 4, we see sanctification, where it is not the positional standing of righteousness, but now, as far as sanctification is concerned, we now are looking to the practical standing of righteousness. And so this is kind of where we're going, a quick summary of these verses 2, 3, and 4. And so we could start off by looking at verse 2. And as we see, it is the Holy Spirit that is responsible for our freedom, according to this verse. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Now, here we see two laws that are in competing, contrasting um, effects with each other. The law of the Spirit and the law of sin and death. Now, the term here is not referring to Mosaic law or moral law, but instead it is referring to more along the lines of a regulating principle, this principle that we would adhere to, that we see throughout Scripture, the law of Christ or the law of faith. And and so we also see this, this principle as far as sin and death, uh, referring to this power, this dominion, this control That sin had over our mind and affections and our attitude and yes, even our will. And this power of sin, this law of sin and death did not just stop as far as just consuming our heart, mind and soul. But it also continued with a penalty. A physical death, a spiritual death and yes, an eternal death. In this fallen world, our fallen nature... There is sin that enslaves. There is sin that enslaves. There is death that reigns. And there is death that ultimately destroys. And doesn't just destroy on this world. It eternally destroys. But this law of the spirit brings about freedom. It brings about righteousness. It brings about life. And and this new reality has been wrought by the interworkings of of the Spirit of God that was at work before conversion, that was softening the heart of a believer, that was allowing the believer to see his or her great need for a Savior. And at that moment of salvation, when we were brought from death to life, it was a Spirit that was powerfully working for our freedom, for our liberation, For our emancipation. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts, that converts, that seals, indwells, empowers, and refines. It is the Holy Spirit that broke the chains, broke the chains of sin's power, broke the chains of sin's penalty, broke the chains of sin's finality. And so may we never minimize the great power of God the Spirit that was at work before our conversion, that is at work currently in our life in Christ, and that will continue to be at work all the way until we see Christ in glory. And so, point number one can be summarized quite simply. 
the Holy Spirit has liberated us from the law of sin and death. The Holy Spirit has liberated us from the law of sin and death. We see God the Spirit at work in verse 2. And then now, in verses 3 and 4, uh, we see this marvelous display, or verse 3, we see this marvelous display again of the three persons of the Trinity, the one triune God, all working collectively together for our great, great gift of salvation. Romans 8, 3. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh. So God has now done what the law could not do, what we in our weakened flesh could not do. The law cannot save. And then here Paul shifts back as far as this word law, referring now again to a moral law, not as a regulatory principle as we see in verse 2. But in review, we've talked about this many times. The law has been established to reveal to us our sin. And we actually even see how the law is present to even agitate and stir up our sin so that sin may be seen to be sin. And, and so the law was established to measure, to uh, provide a measure and standard and a plumb line of righteousness to recognize how desperately we have fallen short of the righteousness and the glory of God. In the law, though, as far as its saving capacity, is powerless. Powerless to save us from our sin. And we, as the verse states, weakened in our sinful flesh, are also powerless to save ourselves. We are incapable of 100% law adherence in order to achieve this level of righteousness, which would be the standard to stand before a holy, sovereign God. And this is reiterated in Galatians 3. And in Galatians 3, we actually see a stark warning against this whole premise of thinking that our good works, our righteous acts, our law adherence would actually be enough to satisfy and to be able to stand before holy God. It states, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. This is a warning. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Again, the law can only serve as a diagnosis for the sickness. The law can only serve as a spiritual mirror so we can indeed see the sin that besets us. So that we could see that there's a problem, that we are incapable and powerless to do anything about it in our weakened flesh. And so the law can't save. We can't save ourselves. So what is man to do? What is man to do in regard to this condemnation? What is mankind to do in regard to this penalty of sin and death? What is mankind to do with the eternal Wrath of God that awaits us. And this brings us to point number two. What the law and what the weakened flesh could not do, God did. God did. Praise be to God that he intervened. That he delivered us. That he redeemed us. That he saved us. That he made a way for sinful man to be reconciled back to holy God. Yes, good old John 3.16 and going KJV here. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son and whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I remember as a kid, that was the first Bible verse that I memorized because I had this little coin that my mom gave me. And it had that verse. And it's probably like, oh, wow, someone's going to pick up that coin and thinks it's actually money, right? And then they're like, oh, it's just a Bible verse. But that Bible verse will save you. It's more valuable than any amount of money that you could ever come across in this world. That's probably how Ray Comfort, those of you guys that did the way of the master, came up with the $100,000 bill. It's like, oh, look, it's a dollar bill. Oh, no, it's not. It's a Bible verse, so... Um, anyhow, uh, Ray Comfort, yeah, do you consider yourself a good person? No, I'm just sorry. That's, my, that's what happens when Koreans do a uh, 
whatever his accent was, so sorry. But may we never forget the beauty of this verse. John 3.16. How God's great love for us is on display by sending his son in the flesh in order that we may be saved. This is what verse 3 states. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Now much is said in these few words. These are very definitive and distinct words that speak of the incarnation in Christ, which is his arrival in human form. Now it does not say that he was sent in sinful flesh. It states that he was sent in the likeness of sinful flesh. He was fully man, fully God, the hypostatic union, humbling humbling himself by being found in human form, being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, tempted as we are tempted and yet being found without sin. Tempted as we have been tempted yet being found without sin. And this is very important as we see in Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest that is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Again, tempted as we are yet without sin. And this is very important when we are looking at the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Why? This taking on of likeness of sinful flesh, yet remaining sinless, is of absolute necessity. Because the only sufficient sacrifice that is capable of atoning for the sins of the entirety of mankind, the only sacrifice that was capable of eradicating the entire sacrificial system found in Levitical law in the Old Testament, the only sacrifice that would be able to do this is one that was perfect and sinless and blameless, and that's who Jesus Christ was. Here's the thing, if Jesus Christ was not sinless, then he would not have been a worthy sacrifice. Instead of Jesus Christ being the sacrifice, he would have now required a sacrifice to atone for his own sins. Very important. He would not have been the propitiation necessary to appease the wrath of God because he would have been sinful. Thus, rendering his sacrifice on the cross useless unworthy, and most importantly, insufficient. But because of his sinful, sinless nature, because of his perfection, because he was tempted as we are tempted yet found to be without sin, he now has the authority, as the verse states, to condemn sin in the flesh. He stands victorious over sin and death, breaking its power its rule, its authority, and its claim that it once had on our life. And this is why you will probably regularly hear this verse as Travis and I preach through God's word because it speaks into Jesus Christ being the victor, being victorious over sin and death. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting Of death is sin, but the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we can see that the sinless incarnation found in verse 3 is of great importance. It is of great importance. As we see, it is sandwiched in between justification, verses 1 and 2, And sanctification in verses 4. So we actually see justification, incarnation, and sanctifications. And so, um, yes, both of these statements speak into justification, verses 1 and 2. Again, this positional perspective of righteousness that leads to sanctification, which is this practical perspective of righteousness. And so, in this transition, we see a cause and effect Clause. And we talked about this way back when, I think during Advent season, what is known as a Hina Clause. A Hina Clause is this happens, therefore this is the effect. And so you might see words such as 
so that, so that you do this, or so that you don't do this, or see to it that you do this, or see to it that you don't do this. And in this case, we see this hint of clause of being in order that. These verses are saying, going back to verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So you are in Christ Jesus. You have been freed and liberated by the Spirit in order that, in order that the righteous requirement of the law may now be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but who walk according to the Spirit. And this is the result. This is the mandate of justification. Our sanctification. Very important. God did not just save us as believers so that we may arrive into the eternal kingdom. He did not just save us from hell. God also saved us to be holy. Be holy as I am holy. And these two items of justification and sanctification, they do not exist independent of one another. It's a package deal. When you are justified, this process of sanctification immediately begins. If you are truly saved, if you are saved, you do not go back to living the same way in which you once did. It's not a situation in which you are delivered from darkness into the marvelous light and say to yourself, well, I'll actually start living the way that the Lord wants me to Sometime down the road, when it's convenient for me, when, when I don't have all of these things that I have to attend to. It's like the rich young ruler. That's not what happens at conversion. Justification and sanctification take place simultaneously. It's not how it works to say, I got saved, but I'll start living the Christian life when it's of convenience for me. Now, what that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that we don't stumble and fall flat on our face. That we don't struggle through seasons of sin. I mean, just see exhibit A, right? Chapter 7, Paul, what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. It is absolutely normal. The battle, the war will wage on between our flesh and the spirit, between Sin and righteousness between the old self, the old man, the old woman, and the new creation we now are in Christ. The struggle is indeed real and will be all the way till we arrive in glory. It also doesn't mean that everyone is going to look the same, right? We are going to be at different places in this process of sanctification. There is no doubt about it. Everyone is not going to look the same on this lengthy road of becoming more and more like Christ. So what that means is this. Let's be careful with the judgment. Let's allow the judgment to be for God. Judgment is mine, right? Saith the Lord. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay We are all a work in progress, are we not? (laughs) We are all a work in progress. Say to your neighbor, I'm a work in progress. I'm a work in progress. And and husbands, you could, if you're married in here, look to your wife and say, honey, I'm a work in progress. She's going to look at you and say, I know. (laughs) I know. Now, it goes both ways, all right? (laughs) But let's be very careful. And let's be very prayerful. Before we just choose to pick out the speck in our brother or sister's eye, when we not only have a log or a plank, but, bro, you might have a redwood tree in your eye, okay? And so it's very important that we know that we are at different places on this road 
of sanctification. Yes, we speak truth in love. Yes, we speak truth in grace. And yes, that is why we are told to admonish or even correct or reprove at times. But let's make sure that we're doing it very carefully and doing it very prayerfully and doing it very under consideration, putting on humility in our own lives before we start chasing other people's sin. What are we told in 1 Corinthians 10, 12? If anyone thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. And so this synonymous relationship with justification and sanctification, it doesn't mean we won't struggle. It doesn't mean we won't at times just be in these seasons where the fight is so pronounced and so prevalent like at a place that we've never found in our lives before. And we're going to be talking about this over the next couple of weeks that what it means to put to death the deeds of the body through the Spirit It also doesn't mean that we're all going to be at the same place as far as this process, this lengthy road and journey of sanctification. But what it does mean is this. Upon justification, uh, upon the Lord saying, you are mine, our trajectory changes. Our direction in life changes is going in a different place. We are now under the Lord's jurisdiction. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. We are a bondservant of Christ. And now we seek to live a life that pleases Him. We seek to live a life that follows after Him. We seek to live a life that is obedient to Him. We seek to live a a life that brings glory to Him. And we seek to live a life, as we see in verse 4, to fulfill the righteous requirement of the law and also to not walk according to the flesh, but now to walk according to the Spirit. And this is really bringing this whole message full circle This is the name of our message today. We have been justified by the Spirit in order that we can be sanctified in the Spirit. Justified by the Spirit, sanctified in the Spirit. How do we walk in the Spirit? Now, This is, again, one of those multifaceted answers. And we're going to be jumping into many of these things as we continue through the book of Romans and specifically in chapter 8. But for today, we're just going to send us home with two practical, immediate things that we could do by walking in the Spirit. First of all, we are filled with the Spirit of God when we are filled with the Word of God. We are filled with the Spirit of God when we are filled with the Word of God. I quoted earlier, but the Helper... The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now, where do all of these things that Christ has said, where are all these things found? Well, they are found in the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit, according to Ephesians 6.17 That the word of God may richly dwell in you according to Colossians 3.16. Or 6.17 for Ephesians. And if we do not cherish the word of God, if we do not take in the word of God, if we do not hide the word of God in our heart, in our mind, and in our soul, then how do we expect to be filled with the spirit of God? You might want to write this down if you're not doing blanks. The Spirit of God illuminates the Word of God in order that, Hina, that the child of God can look like the Son of God. To transform the child of God to look like the Son of God. The Holy Spirit always directs the glory to God the Father and God the Son, and we are to do the same. Not drawing attention to ourself, 
but always directing this glory to God the Father, God the Son. And so this is very important because the goal of sanctification is to be transformed from one degree of glory into the next, to look more and more like Christ. That's the goal. The goal of sanctification is to be transformed from one degree of glory to the next, to be looking more and more like Jesus Christ, our Savior, our model, and our example. And so that's one way. I want to be a more spirit-filled Christian. Well, I want to know more and more of God's word and to be filled more and more with the word of God. And again, many ways in which this question could be answered that we'll be dropping into. But the next way is this. Put on the fruit of the spirit. Put on the fruit of the spirit. Oftentimes when we look at Galatians 5, 22 and 23, and don't worry, I'm not going to make it weird, bring it out like a fruit basket or attaching your favorite Bible verse to your favorite fruit, strawberry or pomegranate or anything like that. But I would say this. Oftentimes we look at this verse, a very well-known passage, and we look at it from the perspective of that when we are found to be in Christ, these are the attributes and byproducts that we now have in Christ. And I would say that is correct. But also this. Oftentimes we negate that list instead of taking this list and using it as a spiritual inventory, a spiritual litmus test to actually say, am I putting on these attributes? Am I putting on these characteristics? Am I putting on these things which would say that I am a spirit-filled follower and believer of Jesus Christ? Oftentimes, we can find ourselves looking for some type of experience. And not that experience is bad or wrong in any way, shape, or form. There can be some that are. But the Holy Spirit, there is an aspect of experience that comes with the Holy Spirit. However, oftentimes, we don't do the hard work of stepping towards the Spirit, which oftentimes just means rolling up our sleeves and doing some self-reflection, doing some self-evaluation and asking ourselves, am I actually in the Spirit based on what we see in this passage of Scripture in Galatians 5.22 and 5.23? Or even on the other side of the equation. Sometimes we just merely have memorized this verse for the sake of memorization and not truly applied this verse to our lives. For just for the sake, so we're all talking the same language and speaking of this very verse, and we could take it home with us this week. Let's go ahead and read Galatians 5, 22 and 23 out loud. All right, here we go. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such things there is no law. Man, sorry, that was my bad. I just totally flunked you guys on the cadence, so all right, well, let's do it again. No, let's not do it again. <laughs> but Christian, follower of Christ, Redeemer Church, can we look at this verse and say this? When we're talking about the Spirit of God. Am I being loving? Am I being joyful? Would others be able to actually look at me and say that I am a follower of Jesus that is peaceful? That is patient. That is kind. That is good. That is faithful. Would they be able to say that I am gentle? That I am self-controlled. And I would say this is an inventory that we need not only individually to go through, but also one collectively as a church. These are the marks of a spirit-filled follower of Jesus. And so as I stated, lots more to come. But for today, may we appreciate 
this passage of Scripture, these three verses, that it is the Spirit of God. It is God the Spirit that freed us, that delivered us, that emancipated us from the law of sin and death. It is God the Father that sent His only begotten Son to what? To die. To die for us. The righteous became the unrighteous to save our souls and recognize that God the Son was indeed the perfect, incarnate, sinless Lamb of God who hung himself on the cross so that we may have life. All three persons of the glorious triune God at work collectively together for our great salvation. So what that means is do not take your salvation lightly. The power that is at work, that was at work, that will continue to be at work to save you, to save me, is so enormous. So when we see verses like this, let us not gloss over them. Instead, may we fall on our face and say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for saving a wretch like me. Lord, I want to live my life following after you because of what you did for me first. And Lord, I'm going to do that by walking not according to the flesh, I'm going to do that by walking according to the Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the Spirit. God, the Spirit that brings to remembrance all that Jesus said, that teaches us all things. Lord, we pray that we continue to see where you're taking us in all of this. Lord, that we would be submitted to you, Lord, that we would lift up your name, <laughs> that we would even, as we sing, behold the Father's heart, the mystery he lavishes on us, Lord. May we continue to step into so, so much more that you have for us. And Lord, as we leave this week, may we understand that being filled with the Spirit means being filled with the Word of God. And being a spirit-filled follower of Jesus means that we put on the fruit of the Spirit, Lord. So we ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen.